appreciate the warm introduction, Mark. I've been asked here today to talk to you about fraud and more specifically some of the advancements in software technology being used to help detect fraud or provide additional assurance to organisations. During the presentation, I'll put some context around fraud as we see it today, share some general observations we have around factors that perhaps impact on opportunistic behaviour, discuss how data mining is assisting us to close control gaps, and finally share some real life war stories on what we've encountered in recent times. I know that we all understand what fraud is, so I only want to make a couple of key observations here. Firstly, intention is the key part of the definition. There's a significant difference between making a genuine mistake and acting dishonestly. Consider keying errors when processing journals as opposed to coding expenditure to asset accounts to manipulate profits. I know tax accountants out there will be thinking who on earth would do that for deductible expenditure. However, let me assure you sometimes personal motivation is, is greater. It's also worth pointing out that an organisation's view on what constitutes fraud varies. As an example, I sit on the board of a large organisation interstate that deals with significant government money and is under public scrutiny. Within their fraud policy, unauthorised usage of motor vehicles, misappropriation of stationery is explicit. I know this isn't the case with privately owned enterprise. So I'd put it to you as CFOs out there charged with internal control governance. Do you have a fraud policy? Is the definition appropriate? And more importantly, do your employees have a consistent view and understanding of this? When I discuss fraud, I'm more talking about asset misappropriation, so taking cash, or financial statement fraud, which is the intentional manipulation of accounts. This presentation certainly is not covering anything to do with identity, theft, or credit card fraud. In all frauds, we know there are three elements present. That is pressure, opportunity, and an ability to rationalise your own behaviour. Clearly, it's the opportunity element that you as business can impact upon, and therefore that will form the focus of the remaining part of my presentation. I guess in South Australia, fraud is real and present in our local market, and we've had many recent uh, public fraud issues. There's a South Australian-based transport company who had the CFO and company secretary transfer $22 million of funds directly to bookmakers uh, from company accounts. Surprise, surprise, winnings were of course deposited into his personal accounts, so I guess he had a good way of uh, stacking odds in his favour from a punting viewpoint. Clearly he had a, a massive gambling problem, which is the pressure, and could rationalise his own behaviour. There's also a South Australian based university that had $27 million taken over a two year period by a cashier who had access to bank accounts. It's just mind boggling that this level of misappropriation can occur and go unnoticed for two years. It's also very simple in nature, transferring money. And however, the culprit clearly had good intentions, could rationalise his own behaviour as he was investing the money, upskilling to becoming a loan broker and assumed he would be able to pay everything back and only take the profits. It's a bit of a shame that in the first nine months he lost approximately $1.2 million while learning the new trade. And you can't go without mentioning a South Australian legal practice that had a key finance employee steal $2.7 million. Again, very simple, simple fraud. Just had the right passwords and transferred money directly into his own, own account, basically to fund a lavish lifestyle. So how can this go on? It's all about the opportunity. They're all the trusted employees who could override the process and try, some better than others, to cover up their tracks. And yes, two of the above mentioned companies were audited, and I'll get into uh, the expectation gap around audit later on in my, my presentation. I'll ask how much do you think goes on that we don't hear about, and later in the presentation I'll share some not so public stories that uh, we deal with as well. We know from published studies that financial pressure is now the most significant motivator of recent fraud activities and that the key weapon in defence is the internal control environment of an organisation. There are many statistics out there to support this. However, I've put some slides on from, from the KPMG and Melbourne University Fraud Survey 
as this covers Australian and New Zealand business, so uh, I believe it's more relevant for, for you. Interesting, non-management employees are still the most significant perpetrators, accounting for 49% of fraud. And there has been an increase in senior executive and director fraud, moving from 2% to 7% of frauds in recent times. I guess another interesting fact is that 82% of fraudsters earn close to $100,000 per year, so we're not talking about individuals that are living below the poverty line or anything like that. They're, they're quite well off. This slide basically shows that there's been an increase in the number of older people committing fraud in the market, with over 55-year-olds increasing from 3% of frauds in 2010 to 14% in 2012. And likewise, the value of the mature age frauds, frauds is uh, undertaking has, accounts for 26% of the total value as opposed to only 2% in prior periods. I'm uh, going to stop bashing baby boomers now because I've got a fellow partner in the room uh, across from me that uh, might not go down so well with, but I have got my eye on you, Grant. <laughs> um, just into motivation, so again, the trend's moved from gambling to lifestyle and greed and now has been taken over by financial pressure. So 93% of reported fraud related to greed in 2010, whereas now the major factor is financial pressure. Uh, we believe this is, a, this is correlated to the GFC from 2008 onwards. And just getting into detection, so obviously from the slide you can see internal controls are key to detection. Um, another quick bit of theory, when we discuss internal controls, we primarily refer to prevent or detect controls. So prevent type controls prevent the opportunity through a physical segregation of duties. These start, for example, with the accountant, say, processing a payment batch, not being able to be part of the release of funds process, and even better, the same employee would be restricted in the system from entering in new employees or supplier data. Detect type controls defer fraud also and are also effective, however, rely on process. These, for example, include hindsight review and, and your, your budget monthly analysis. Again, as detect type controls rely on process, they can be overridden and may, may facilitate opportunistic behaviour. Another point on the slide is um, notification by employees can't be ignored. Um, in my ex personal experience, this is uh, one of the most significant detection techniques. Um, that is fellow employees raising questions and therefore I'm a strong advocate of whistleblower policies within all organisations to, to make that clear on, on how that can be reported. These are some of our own red flags that we share amongst our, our audit staff and our assurance staff and not evidence of fraud, just points of interest and I only touch on a couple. Generally with results and expectation and expectations and trends. If it's too good to be true, it, it can be too good to be true. Taking leave, uh, the CFO from, from the transport company example I provided above um, was caught whilst taking leave for the first time in a long time. Lack of documentation. Um, I once had an audit client who would not let my team look at the breakup of a warranty provision. Uh, my team members were told, basically, this is sensitive information above your pay grade and not needed as part of the audit. Um, I personally went out and, and had a chat to the finance director about this and ended up being able to scan through the transactions making up the balance, finding a nice, neat million dollar accrual right on year end. Turns out that performance bonuses were well and truly met for the year. And in my view, the reversal of a, an accrual in the subsequent year would have helped make the performance bonus in the future. However, we were told that was a, a genuine keying error. Lifestyle and behavioural changes. So again, we, we can't impact on that, but, but taking note of it, we've, we've had a client investigation before where, where the CEO had, I'd had a meeting with him and he'd, he'd told me that uh, a, a well-known and respected person in their finance team changed, changed their lifestyle overnight. Expensive cars, expensive jewellery, um, enrolled the children in expensive schools and they initially thought that she'd had a windfall with the lottery or something of that nature. If 
following her departure from the company, they had some complaints from staff about a lack of superannuation payments being made based on the annual statements they received. Turns out after some investigation that the ex-employee had the payment batches approved appropriately within the system and within the controls within the organisation. However, when uploading to the banking software, she was changing the payment data on superannuation payments to go into her personal account. So obviously that went undetected for some time, and as with the case, as is the case with most long-term frauds, it, was, uh, it gets difficult to recover in them instances. So some key general steps to take. Again, they're on the, the screen. I, I, I won't run through them all, but I'll make some, make some comments. Um, first and foremost, um, as CFOs, you need to be commercial about, about fraud and about risk. So I'd, I'd caveat this, this with saying uh, commerciality needs to be considered first and foremost. Not everybody can have an ideal internal control environment with all prevent type controls. Detect controls are effective if followed. Um, especially if you're restricted in segregation, you can apply due to a smaller finance team. I guess a couple of key points. Your fraud policy should be clear on the actions to take in the event of a fraud, which typically starts with a confidential investigation, moves into a formal investigation, and subsequent actions are made from there. Personally, we recommend in all cases that the, the authorities are contacted at an appropriate time, obviously. Um, as many of the people that that undertake these type of actions move on with no conviction and we certainly encourage breaking the cycle and reinforcing a strong culture of doing the right thing within your organisations. Employee screening can be very hard with privacy laws, however I wouldn't be afraid to ask about resume gaps or companies listed on resumes with no references. Enforce annual leave only when, specifically when there's a key risk, so we're not talking about your gardener on your cleaner here. We're talking about key staff with access to the system and bank accounts. Reporting channels should obviously be clear. Including management in the assessment and management of fraud risk um, sets the culture and sets the right tone for your organisation. Check your internal controls against best practice and again, target your screening of staff and cover the risks. Be commercial. So just some general must have basic fraud controls. I'm sure you've, you've all got these. Um, segregation is key, obviously, and, and best. However, what if you can't segregate duties? Um, source data reporting, so employee change reports, supplier change reports are a very important uh, control and method of picking up uh, unauthorised changes. Hindsight review um, needs to be independent to be most effective. Performance review, so your budget to actual to prior year, margin analysis, all of that information needs to be done on time uh, and with variances investigated, obviously. Uh, dual authorisations, um, I know it sounds prehistoric, but we still do find uh, a number of organisations that don't have this, or uh, when we're running through process with some of our clients, we, we quickly work out that, that, that some of the staff share passwords and access codes and banking tokens to uh, basically essentially override the process. And just lastly, if you have valuable in inventories, make sure you've got some uh, physical restrictions to access. As a final observation, we've noted a tightening of costs in general and the fi and finance and admin administration teams have not been immune to this, as I'm sure you're all aware. We leverage more from our people and our technology today than ever before, which is fantastic for business efficiencies. However, our focus on traditional internal controls need to develop to keep up. When we leverage our team and rely heavily on key people, we naturally create gaps in our control environment, specifically around segregation. This is fine. However, again, detect type controls rely on adherence to process so can be overridden if you've got opportunistic people in your organisation. So perhaps that contributes in some part to a greater opportunity. We've found in the past few years with all businesses our clients are looking for greater value from their service providers. There is an expectation that fraud will be detected by a professional service firm completing an external or internal audit and that certainly creates an expectation gap around the level and extent of testing that's performed within each of them functions. 
I'm going to address this in the next few slides. However, it is clear that data mining is helping us to address them gaps. So what is data mining? I googled data mining this morning and got 130 million hits. I googled big data and got 769 million hits. So I guess it's clear that data and its usage is a significant focus in the current environment and will continue to be so with advancements in technology being made. When we looked at data mining, we certainly analysed a number of products, and they're all products that yourselves can, can go out and, and readily get. And like all software solutions these days, you can get it as an add-on to existing programs or a standalone customised system. The cost varies just like it does with a MyOB subscription as, a, as opposed to a full SAP implementation. And I'll just say the software is really only as useful as you, what you do with the outputs and the analysis. Based on the fact that there are some very good data mining software add-ons, we went with an Excel-based solution. Sophisticated program that essentially allows us to import data and run analytics over the data to highlight discrepancies and summarise the data easily. We understand that with Excel, you have over a million rows of uh, capability and 16,000 columns. So for us operating in the middle market here in Adelaide, um, it, uh, our, our clients are easily accommodated by this tool. So how are we using it? Firstly, to understand the uses, we need to quickly recap the types of testing across various engagements and understand where the expectation gap I mentioned previously lies. Firstly, with external audit, purely undertaken to provide assurance that the financial statements are materially stated. So I'll, I'll put it to you, do you think that credit card expenditure is material to the financial statements when it's typically half a percent of total expenditure? Theoretically, all of that could be fraudulent and the financial statements, again theoretically, would be materially correct. Where do the ex such expenses hit the general ledger? everywhere and anywhere. So again, do you think the smaller amounts will be picked up in external audit testing? Not necessarily. Typical external audit involves a combination of analytics and target testing. So analytics is exactly that, and target testing basically looks, over, looks at items over a certain dollar amount that will provide an overall adequate level of assurance for an account. Sample testing is used, however, to be honest, uh, amongst all audit methodologies, it's a last resort given, given the level of effort required to go into pure sample testing. Internal audit does involve sample testing, typically over the controls of an entity. So if you assume a daily control is to reconcile your bank account, under an internal audit methodology, you'd be required to sample 25 reconciliations throughout the year to prove the control, let's say independent authorisation, operated effectively. If any discrepancies are found, the sample's extended to determine a systemic issue or a one-off issue. So that's a, a brief rundown of sampling. I guess the power of data mining comes from its ability to test an entire population for abnormalities. I'll say that it, it, it's unable to replace internal auditing as checking processes as far as signatures on pieces of paper will always be a manual task. However, if you're looking to sample salary payments, can analyse the entire workforce for a full period and, and include all payments to detect abnormalities. At a high level, the testing we're primarily using that really is at the press of a button is stratifying the data to detect abnormalities or unusual variances, identifying duplicate payments in a data set, identifying duplicate account numbers, which helps us identify any possible false employees or false creditors set up, Identification of duplicate address details or address details that are very close in, in nature. Again, the account numbers may be different, but the address details for statements and whatnot may be similar. And testing payments that are under certain limits. So if we identify a risk with an individual and their authorisation limits $50,000 or $100,000, we can test payments just under that level to, um, to uh, determine whether anything's amiss. What are the benefits of data mining? It's very cost effective, um, it's targeted, and it's a risk-based versus standard methodology. So again, there is no real methodology with data mining, so we can tailor and target 
the, the transactions and the process exactly how the board or the CFO or the CEO would like it. If we go down an internal audit path, say for payroll, we'd have to sample a population of employees um, that may, not, may or may not include all of the finance employees who have system access and whatnot to the, to the, uh, to the organisation. So it's certainly risk-based, targeted. I guess with shortcomings, with everything, there's a reliance on the data. So if your data's poor, the analysis will be poor. And again, it's also a detect type of analysis. So it's picked up after the event and the damage may already be done. I'll just run you through an example of the process we'd, we'd undertake with our data mining tool, um, just basically on a, on a simple payroll, targeted payroll um, project. So the first step, these are our, our core documents of best process key controls. So the first step would be to sit down with, with the finance team, document your process, compare it to, our, to what we would consider best, best practice and best control, and identify gaps that will help us determine whether we need to target uh, specific control gaps or give you some recommendations around best practice. This is essentially a snapshot of our tool. So it sits within Excel as an additional tab. Once you've got the data into a, into a format where it will work, you literally press the button and it will keep your source data as is and create a new tab in the workbook and give you your results. And always there are options to drill down into key information. So we'd start by stratifying the data and this is a, a real file. And we can see that in the, the one period pay period that we looked at, there were 2,000 payments made um, at a value of $3.3 million. And we can see that uh, the circle around 11 was a, was a which, which should be around 12, sorry, was an $11,200 payment. So you can click on the 12 and it brings up the details, the account, the reference, the system reference, so you can track that entry, the date the payment was made and the name. So you can get back in, see, what, see how it was made, who raised the entry, how it was all done. You get a pretty graph with that as well. It's uh, more about the numbers. Um, this is a simple test, so looking over a period of a year um, where we're expecting 26 payments to be made, um, our tool can bring up straight away, look, there's a number of payments there with error next to them, that there's been 27 payments or 32 payments, so again, I haven't expanded that, but I've clicked on the three and shown you the screen breakdown below that, where it drills in and shows us the exact payments, the dates they were made, so we can easily get in and establish whether they're legitimate or not. And just with the matching of information, the smarts within the tool, so we have seen before where people can get a little bit cunning and they'll put different details in if they set a creditor or a supplier up, but they'll have it similar. So 11 House Avenue compared to the number House Avenue, the tool will still pick that up and match that and say, well, you've got a payroll employee with a similar, with the same address as a, as a creditor, so it's something to look into. This slide shows duplicate payments made. So again, we can drill down further into the original source. And again, there are countless tests to perform it, but they're some of the key ones we make. So into some real life examples. I was asked recently or some time ago to, to uh, discreetly look into a senior exec's um, expenditure over a period of time. As part of the initial meeting, we established that his wife worked part-time in the finance team, helping out with some of the admin functions. Based on that, I requested to include her in our sample, um, which we did, and the results ended up being quite interesting. So certainly interesting enough to have some of our assurance staff running around uh, excited. Small items were found for him. However, upon summarising payments to his wife, we noted some significant payments during the year. When we drilled in and had a look in more detail of that. It wasn't simple EFT transfers. What had happened was she'd changed her annual leave balance, her hours balance, by in excess of 1,500 hours and then subsequently paid herself out over, over three months. Um, given the nature of that type of uh, manipulation, we checked sick leave and long service leave balances. Um, 
and found that she had manipulated her sick leave balance as well and taken three months paid off as well. Ended up in uh, jail time being served and clearly there was a segregation and collusion issue within that organisation. Uh, good governance example, we had a client, no existing issues, realisation that they only had detect controls in place and had a significant payroll expenditure with over five, six hundred employees and, and significant creditor payments. Very small finance team with inherent segregation issues. We ran our tool over the information which, which completed the fuzzy match on addresses and we found two instances where key staff members had related creditor companies as active suppliers and, and had significant contracts. All was above board, however, we did note that one staff member in this situation was also charged with preparing the payment batch for her husband's company, so we ended up recommending essentially that one, independent quotes were obtained because the contract was awarded without that, and two, that there are some additional controls around the, the payment to creditors. Another one, large company, foreign ownership, was an external audit client. When we first got the tool, we decided to run run it over the other expenditure account, which seemed to be a bit of a dumping account in, in the general ledger. And we summarised references in the transactional data and cross-referenced that with, with checking some bank references as well. Resulted in us discovering that one of the Australian directors' wives had a credit card um, under the company's name. And it was quite easy for us to pick up some personal expenditure there when the references in the bank statements were to Tiffany and Mimco. Amounted to $100,000 over a two year period of, of mostly small amounts um, and ended up being dealt with internally um, under a payment arrangement. And just a final, a final um, note to, to demonstrate some of the efficiencies of the tool. So we typically deal with legal firms and get forensic um, forensic work on marital disputes. We had one a few years ago prior to having the tool. Significant accounts involved, significant transactions, and it took one of my staff members at least a week worth of work to get through and trace manually all the transfers between accounts and summarise personal expenditure of one of the parties and resulted in roughly a $15,000, $16,000 fee uh, to, to just to trace that information through. We had a very similar request in recent times, um, similar transactions and values, similar number of accounts. We received the data in the format to stick to the tool and on day one we were able to summarise all of the transactions, um, have a pretty good feel on what the personal expenditure was and have a good feel on where all the transfers had gone and the fee ended up being less than uh, $5,000. So there's, certainly for that type of work there was a big difference. So is data mining right for your business? Data's the key, so are you able to extract your data into a suitable format? We generally request to come out and sit down with you and to complete that task. It helps us with our assurance on the completeness of data and also the relevance of the information we get. If your source data is poor, the analysis will be poor. Large versus small organisations. Uh, to be honest, we, we find the value perspective different amongst organisations and generally with the smaller type organisations, it's very much about overall process improvement um, in line with best practice, so that's where a lot of our recommendations come about. However, with the large organisations, they use us to undertake the testing on targeted areas and assurance over, over the specific area is often more important than the overall control process. As an example, if you're an organisation employing over 200 staff, we, we have people come to us and say, well, you know, is checking the employee list easily reviewed and will phantom employees be picked up? I know I personally struggle in our firm to remember all the names of our staff and we're at 150 and work in the same building. Same goes for, for creditor payments, so millions of dollars in a, in a batch payment with all the invoices attached. How effective is the authorisation and approval process? Would you pick up a false invoice uh, if, if the preparer had slipped one in and created a false supplier? This is really where the data mining tool, tool can help larger organisations. So again, not a golden ticket to solve all your control issues. And like any analysis, the value you get out of it is dependent on what you do with the information. Therefore, are you ready to follow up the exceptions and consider underlying process systemic issues? If you are, it's a, it's a great weapon in your internal control environment. That concludes my presentation today. Happy to answer questions and I'll be around during the breaks and, and uh, certainly during the networking drinks tonight. So thank you.